Hi there, this is John, and this is actually part three of our neurologic discussion. So we're done with your part one, and you're done with your part two. So let's start with your part three of neurologic discussion. So as mentioned in your part two, the last topic there was actually the characteristics of your CSF, right? So we're done with that. Let's proceed now to your 12 cranial nerves, okay? Now the 12 cranial nerves are actually part of your peripheral nervous system, right? So actually you have it there in the book, The Chronicle of Medical Surgical Nursing, and if I was mistaken, it's on page 18. So I want you to familiarize the 12 cranial nerves, the importance, pay attention on, okay, what specific cranial nerve that plays a vital role on the outer two-third, okay, two-third uh, taste in the, in the tongue, and the inner one-third taste in the tongue, do not forget that as well as the arc movement, as well as what specific cranial nerve is responsible for pupil constriction and pupil dilation, okay? So those are things that, can, those are actual things that can be seen in the chronicle of medical surgical nursing, okay? So a 712 cranial nerve, I want you to pay attention on the Glasgow comma scale. Remember, your Glasgow comma scale is a very important tool to evaluate neurologic functioning of the patient, right? This is actually a tool that will evaluate neurologic, okay, functioning based on three criteria and what are those you have your eye opening the verbal response and the motor response you have it okay you have it there in the chronicle of medical surgical nursing just remember that the perfect score in your blessed Kukomo scale is 15 am i right and the lowest score that we can give is actually three now in the event that the patient is intubated of course if the patient is intubated the patient cannot talk so you cannot clearly evaluate the verbal response so if the patient is intubated, instead of having a score of 15 over 15, the perfect score for an intubated patient is 10 over 10. Clear? I hope so. Now, having said that a perfect score is 15, now the thing that you need to remember here is that if there is a decrease in the score of the patient of equal or more than two points, it must be reported to the physician. For example, the glass of common scale of the patient at 8 o'clock in the morning is 15. That's 8 o'clock in the morning. That's 15 score. Around 12 noon, you check the GCS, and the GCS now is actually 13. So from 15, it dropped to 13. Therefore, there's a decrease of two points, right? So remember, if there's a decrease of two points or more than two points in the glass of common scale result of the patient, it must be reported to the physician. Do not forget that. Okay, so another thing that you need to remember about assessment will be the transition in the level of consciousness of the patient. Remember, this is the transition of the level of consciousness. Patient is actually alert. Can you follow? Alert, or we call it patient is full conscious. Then when the patient deteriorates from alert, it down goes to you, to your confusion. Then from your confusion, it goes to your what? Of course, lethargy. You know, lethargy patient lethargy you know lethargy okay that is letter a letter b letter g you know kidding aside lethargy patient is lethargic then from lethargy a okay, patient becomes what obtunded right from obtunded patient becomes what's too poor and then down patient is what comma am i right so this will be the transition in the level of consciousness now let's try to combine the result in your glass to comma scale and of course the transition in the level of consciousness okay so i want you to write this down uh, remember the score is actually 15 right if it is alert that will be 14 to 15. can you follow and then uh, confusion lethargy that will be 11 to 13. if the patient is obtunded that goes as well as with obtunded it's too poor uh, that will be 8 to 10 and then comma that will be 4 to 7 can you follow so this will be the result in your Glasgow comma scale the lowest score that you can give is actually 3 now where's 3 there one three is actually deep comma and if the score of the patient is 3 patient is in deep comma with a very poor prognosis or most probably the patient is dead Okay, so this will be the result in your Glasgow comma scale with respect to the level of consciousness of the patient. Okay, now so please do not forget this. Another thing you need to remember in your examination will be the intracranial pressure. Okay, allow me to clear the board and clean the board as well.
intracranial pressure or ICP. Remember, intracranial pressure is actually a pressure exerted against the skull, right? Now, the normal ICP, as mentioned, the normal ICP, other book, it's 0 to 15, other book, 8 to 15. That is why to make it safe, the normal ICP must be less than 15 millimeters mercury. It must be less than 15 millimeters mercury. Can you follow? Good. Now, there are actually three factors that will affect intracranial pressure. Now, what are three factors that will affect ICP? First will be the CSF volume. Can you follow? Remember that the normal CSF volume is about 100 to 150 ml. 100 to 150 ml. Now, if the CSF volume increases, okay, if the CSF volume increases, it will, it will also increase the intracranial pressure. Now, give me a condition wherein the CSF volume rises. Example, patient having hydrocephalus, right? So, a patient with hydrocephalus expected that there will be increased ICP. Now, another factor that will affect intracranial pressure will be the blood volume. Now, question. Inside the brain, okay, inside the brain, how many cc of blood is inside the brain? For an adult brain, inside, there is about 100, 150 ml of blood inside the brain. Now, if in the brain, there's more than 150 cc of blood, example, if there is bleeding inside the brain, then that will also increase intracranial pressure, okay? The third and the last factor that will affect ICP will be the brain volume. Okay, question. Okay, your brain is about how many ml? Well, your brain, average brain of an adult is about 1,400 ml, okay? Now, give me a condition wherein the brain volume increases more than 1.4K. Well, example, patient having brain tumor. Remember, if there is a brain tumor, if it is a tumor, that's a new growth, right? It's a new tissue. Therefore, if there's a new tissue that grows inside the brain, then that will increase the brain mass. It will also increase the brain volume. That is why patient having brain tumor will also have increased intracranial pressure, okay? Now, thing to remember again, now, since the, case, since the brain is a very important structure in the body, and ICP, when ICP increases, when the pressure is so high, it will crush, it will crush the brain inside, right? That is why okay, there is a specific doctrine or hypothesis that will somehow establish or regulate the normal intracranial pressure. And that hypothesis or doctrine states that an increase in one element is compensated by other elements. For example, if the CSF volume increases, the blood volume decreases. Why? Just to establish a normal intracranial pressure. If the brain volume increases, CSF volume, blood volume will decrease. Again, to establish a normal ICP. Now, what they call the doctrine or hypothesis that states that an increase in one element is compensated by other element. You call that doctrine a sure Monroe Kelly doctrine or Monroe Kelly hypothesis. Okay? Now, please do not forget that. Now, if a patient is having an increased intracranial pressure, you have the signs and symptoms there. You just have to read, okay, read those signs and symptoms. I want to emphasize a late manifestation of an increased ICP. A late presentation of increased ICP is what we call Cushing or shall I say Cushing's triad. Now, why do we call it Cushing's or Cushing's triad? Because it has three presentations, right? So what are presentations under Cushing's or Cushing's triad? Number one, a patient with increased ICP will have an increase in your systolic blood pressure. Number two, there will be a decrease in your diastolic pressure. And last, there will be a decrease in the heart rate of the patient. So these are three conditions present during Cushing's triad. Again, Increased systolic BP, decreased diastolic BP, and a decrease in the heart rate. Take note, when there is an increase in the systolic and a decrease in the diastolic pressure, there will be a widening or an increase in the pulse pressure. Can you follow? The question there, what is the normal pulse pressure? And how will you get the pulse pressure? Well, to get the pulse pressure, you have to subtract systolic and diastolic. Whatever is the difference, that is the pulse pressure. Again, the normal pulse pressure ranges from 30, sorry, ranges from 30 to 40 millimeters mercury. Can you follow? That's 30 to 40 millimeters mercury. Let me give an example. 
Example. Example the vital signs on the patient. Let's say the BP of the patient is 120 over 80 millimeters mercury. And the heart rate of the patient, let's say 86 beats per minute. Normal or abnormal? Of course, these are normal signs, right? These are normal vital signs. These are normal within the normal range. But if the patient is having an increase in the intracranial pressure, the systolic pressure increases, let's say, from 120, just an example, from 120, it goes up to 160. Can you follow? And the diastolic pressure decreases, let's say, from 80, it goes down to 60. Okay, millimeters mercury. And the heart rate of the patient drops, let's say, from 86, it goes down. It, okay, we have 49 beats per minute. This is what we call your Cushing or Cushing triad. Now, what is the pulse pressure here? 160 minus 60, a difference of 100. Remember, 100, the normal is 30 to 40. If there's an increase in the pulse pressure, that is actually a late presentation of increase in the cranial pressure. But of course, for pediatric, aside from, from uh, neurologic deterioration, a pediatric would increase ICP, of course, because of the very soft fontanelles, expect that there will be bulging fontanelles, an increase in the head circumference, Okay, I'm about to be projectile vomiting, vomiting, patient will have poor sucking reflex, patient will have a high pitch cry, am I right? So those are presentations of pediatric with increased intracranial pressure. Nevertheless, a patient with increased ICP, do not forget, you have to give mannitol, am I right? It is actually a form of an osmotic diuretic that will promote diuresis in order to decrease ICP. The thing you need to remember in your exam is that if you are the nurse, if you're the charge nurse, taking good care of patient with increased ICP positioning is so essential. So how will you position the patient with increased ICP? Well, knowing that there is an increased pressure in the brain, you need to position the patient in such a way that it will prevent further increase in the ICP. So how will you position the patient? Well, you have to you have to elevate the head of the bed, or we call that a sharp Fowler's position. Now in your examination if, the, there, if there is an increase in the intracranial pressure the head of the patient must be in neutral or neutral position or center do not allow the patient's head to face on the side or on the other side why because if you allow the patient's, patient's head to face on the sides it you, you're going to compress the blood vessels on the sides of the neck right or on the other side you compress the blood vessels on the sides of the neck Compressing the blood vessels on the sides of the neck will impede normal venous return. So as a result, if the blood cannot go back to the heart, it affects blood, normal blood circulation, blood will congest in the upper part, it will increase ICP. That is why if, if the condition is increased ICP, elevate the head of the bed and the head must be in neutral position. That is for increased ICP. But if the condition is, or if the question is, how would you position the head of the patient to promote drainage of secretions to prevent aspiration, then that is the time you allow the patient's head to face on the side. Please do not forget the question. Please do not forget. Sometimes students will have a hard time figuring it out. Okay? So please do not forget that. Okay? Okay, let's proceed. Allow me to clear the board again. Now, I mentioned ICP, please do not forget that if there is an increase in the intracranial pressure, a procedure like your lumbar topping or spinal topping is contraindicated. I think I mentioned that in a video two or video one, I forgot, but I mentioned that, right? Now, this will be the outline of our discussion for neurologic disturbances, okay? So we will talk about, we will talk about cerebrovascular accident. This is actually your stroke, am I right? The number two, we will talk about the J narrative disorders, right? Just like your Parkinson's disease. The number three, we will talk about autoimmune disorders. Now when you say autoimmune, you have your multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then you have your myasthenia gravis, right? Then number four, we will talk about amyotropic lateral sclerosis or your ALS, or this is what we call your Blue Gehrig's disease, all right? Then number five, we will talk about spinal cord injury. Can you follow? So these are things that we will discuss in the next video clips. Okay? So this is actually the end of 
the anatomy and physiology of your nervous system. The following clips or the following discussions will be more on disturbances, okay? So I hope before you will play the disturbances or check the videos regarding these disorders, you finish viewing, okay, video clip number one, number two, and number three, okay? So I'll see you again in the next video clip. God bless. Bye.